The RHI scandal left a trail of mayhem in its wake. The greatest mistake that I have ever made. It claimed many political casualties. The one survivor is still centre stage. I want to uh, acknowledge my faith in Almighty God and the acknowledgement that His grace is sufficient in all things. But Arlene Foster has been badly damaged. I, I suppose, looked up to her. How much has your opinion of Mrs. Foster changed? Mm. I mean, there's a lot of mistakes have been made on her watch. How much has trust in the political system been shredded? A damning indictment of what passed for government. This absolutely has to be a watershed and a bit of a last chance. The cynic would say it's the biggest last chance since the last time. The coronavirus crisis is already testing unity in the new executive. Tonight on Spotlight, we assess RHI's damage to public trust, just when our leaders need it most. At the end of 2016, Spotlight reported on the catastrophic cost of the green energy scheme known as the Renewable Heat Incentive, or RHI. At the heart of the scheme was a fatal flaw, the lack of anything like sufficient control. It meant the department ended up with a scheme where the more you burn, the more you earn. Cash for ash. Boiler owners were being paid £1.60 for every pound they spent on fuel, committing Northern Ireland to spend £400 million it didn't have. The financial scandal that followed was like no other. Father, hear our prayer. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen hundreds of millions of pounds, which is going to have to be clawed back out of schools, and hospitals and roads. It left First Minister Arlene Foster, who set up the scheme, fighting for her political life. What we have here are facts being disregarded in a fevered quest to build my political gallows. The crisis dissolved the political partnership at the heart of government in Northern Ireland. Today at Stormont started with the very bombs that hold it together melting under the heat generated by the eco-friendly energy scandal. You're losing, the, you're losing the run of yourselves. This issue is about public confidence. Eventually, RHI collapsed government in Northern Ireland altogether. Stormont's last act in 2017 was to set up a public inquiry to rake through the ashes of RHI. The RHI inquiry wasn't simply about finding out what went wrong and holding those responsible to account. According to the man who set it up, it had another fundamental focus. The inquiry's main purpose was to restore public faith in government. Rest assured, every stone will be turned by getting to the truth of the RHI scandal, this inquiry team, led by the distinguished Sir Patrick Coughlin, will go some way to rebuilding the shattered public confidence in these institutions. In fact, the longer this inquiry went on, the more it revealed government scandal beyond RHI. Months of hearings exposed a catalogue of failures by ministers, their political advisers who were paid by the taxpayer, and a large body of civil servants. I have to acknowledge that multiple failings, multiple mistakes were made, and that we should have done better. 1341 medium wave. This is BBC Radio Ulster. It runs to more than 600 pages in three volumes. The RHI report is damning of how government here was done. In the midst of the coronavirus alert, there was significant interest from politicians and journalists 
when the inquiry delivered its long-awaited report on Friday. Sir Patrick Coughlin says corruption was not the cause of what went wrong. Rather, it flowed from an accumulation of errors and omissions missed by people who weren't paying enough attention. The problem for our politicians now is that just when they're back at Stormont and asking us to trust their leadership in the midst of a public health crisis, this report details a whole series of criticisms of every layer of government. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome. Pendant For her part, Arlene Foster said sorry. When I first started out on this journey, I said I didn't think that I had done anything uh, wrong. Of course, we've now had the forensic account, uh, and so with hindsight, I can see that there are issues uh, that I should have dealt with in a different way, and of course I apologise for that. The inquiry chairman said RHI was a project too far, and there's a chance it could all happen again. There is no guarantee that the weaknesses shown in governance, staffing, and leadership revealed by the inquiry's investigation of the scheme could not combine again to undermine some future initiative. So how deep is the damage to public trust? We brought together a panel to dissect the RHI report. They know Stormont's hidden corridors well. Felicity Houston was the Commissioner for Public Appointments. Stephen Grimison was the Director of the Executive Information Service for many years. And former BBC political producer Mary Kelly is a columnist for the Irish News. They began by scrutinising how the inquiry exposed a cavalier attitude towards Stormont's rules. One of the very striking pieces of evidence in this process was former First Minister Peter Robinson when questioned about the appointment of special advisers, for example. He says, we plied our trade on the front line of Northern Ireland politics. We functioned in a rough and inauspicious climate and we did not live our lives consulting a rule book at every minute. Is that very representative, do you think, of the culture that existed that is exposed in this report? I think it's, it's absolutely the way they ran things. What's the point of having a rule book? What's the point of having rules if you can just say, well, th this is a rough and tough world, we don't have to look at them? What about you, Felicity? You were in charge of the rules, really? Well, I was, and I know how, how keen they are to try and avoid them, so more effort is put into circumventing them than, than complying with them. My experience across all the departments was a desire to find a way round the rules. One of the most incredible things I think that people found during the inquiry was this n no taking of notes. Mm -hmm. And why? Because both parties, the DUP and Sinn Féin, were sensitive to criticism. I only, really? discovered, I only discovered after I had left government that the Civil Service Code in Whitehall had a provision in it that we should be taking contemporaneous and good notes and that you know everything should be recorded. That provision was taken out of the Northern Ireland Civil Service Code. And that really surprised me. And I was in the civil service at the time, I was blissfully unaware of this. Who took that out and why? I think the note taking will most certainly change because the civil service won't want to be caught out that way. But the idea that a senior civil servant will tell an inquiry that the reason they didn't take notes was to preserve those parties from embarrassment should there be a freedom of information. And that goes totally against the culture. Why was freedom of information brought in if it could be thwarted that way? As well as notes not being taken, the inquiry heard other evidence of bad practice. Some special advisers used party and private email accounts, which meant the parties, rather than the civil service, controlled the official record of what was done behind closed doors. Well, it's ridiculous, apart from anything else, given modern cyber security uh, situations, it's crazy you're actually putting, you know, the amount of hacking that's going on. Did for putting, Hillary Clinton. Yes. <laughs> you can, you, so you can see that that is just bad behaviour. But why was it done? It was done to, to again circumvent freedom of information. If it wasn't on the government system, then the government couldn't provide it under freedom of information. This began to happen a lot during NAMA uh, and at that point, I think there were advisers warned because it, it emerged that actually these accounts were being used 
this is not good practice. That was largely ignored. The use of private email accounts was also an issue when the RHI inquiry went searching for evidence from the DUP. On Friday, the DUP stressed it had cooperated fully with the inquiry. But we have obtained unpublished correspondence from the inquiry, casting doubts on whether the DUP had handed over all its relevant internal emails. It said the DUP had only provided a limited amount of email and the inquiry would be surprised if there's not additional email correspondence. The DUP did hand over more emails, but the story didn't end there. One of the key inquiry findings was against Timothy Johnston, special advisor to three DUP first ministers. He was rarely far from their shoulders. Right, come on. I do solemnly swear that the evidence I shall give to this inquiry, that the evidence I shall give when to Mr. Johnston testified. He said that at the time the renewable heat scheme started to unravel, he barely knew what RHI was. From my point of view, I didn't have the knowledge. I wouldn't have had the knowledge at that time around RHI issues. I didn't have any background knowledge of it. I know you've, you, you've told us that. But the inquiry didn't accept this. In its report, it says he was much more involved in the summer of 2015 than he had claimed in his sworn testimony. This is the super spad. This is the guy like the spider in the centre of the web and is, has every part of that web is covered. He knows everything that's going on and I always found him to be incredibly well informed about every department that he had people in. How much did he know and when did he know it? That was at the centre of what the inquiry was looking at. The key piece of evidence against Johnston was an email only given to the inquiry at the last minute, but not by the DUP. It came from another former advisor, Timothy Cairns, who no longer had any connections with the party, and it showed the renewable heat incentive had been brought to Mr Johnston's attention. Mr Cairns told the inquiry he found it in his old DUP email account. But we can reveal the DUP told the inquiry that Cairns' account had been checked 18 months before he found the email. So how could it possibly have been missed? What if Timothy Cairns hadn't found this email later? You know, what would have happened? Th these inquiries shouldn't leave questions unanswered. And the problem with this email is that it poses a question. This email doesn't come from the DUP. So I think that calls into question the degree of cooperation that they give. There was an old, rather cynical saying uh, in the civil service that you would offer someone every type of uh, assistance except actual help. This goes to the heart of how open and transparent this process is. Journalist and author Sam McBride followed every twist of the RHI controversy. The central element of this is that government business was routinely being transacted on dup.org.uk accounts and likewise this was happening in Sinn Féin and so therefore this is not some tangential um, uh, minor point, this is central to what was going on within government. This was the real record of government business. For, for people looking in from the outside, in very simple terms, if you have significant government emails under your control and you don't immediately hand those over, I think people have a reason to be sceptical and to ask questions as to why you didn't do so. In a statement, the DUP said it took all necessary steps to comply with the legal requirements of the inquiry. It said the inquiry had been provided with all relevant material. It acknowledged there was correspondence between the inquiry and the party seeking further material that had not been provided initially. It said the party had commissioned IT consultants to conduct further searches to ensure full compliance. It said it was assumed, given his role in events, that Timothy Cairns would also be under an obligation to search accounts to which he had access. The statement does not explain how a crucial email was discovered in an account the party said 
it had already searched. The RHI inquiry didn't just find fault with special advisers. It also found that their bosses, the elected ministers, were riding roughshod over employment regulations. These are the rules that ministers were supposed to follow when appointing their special advisor at the time when the whole RHI controversy first ignited. And they're quite detailed, setting out how ministers should draw up a pool of candidates. Well, what is a pool? Why is it important? Well, a pool is there to give a minister a choice. It's, I mean, it's the case with, with um, you know, any public appointment. You find three or four people who are suitable, normally having gone through some sort of selection process, and, and then a minister could say, well, actually, let's, X has got this going for him, and Y's got that going for her. And then there's the issue of, of, of an ability to work together. It's very important for a special advisor. The inquiry found repeated and widespread failures to follow the employment regulations because parties pick special advisors, not ministers. It heard super spad Timothy Johnston had more power over an appointment than elected minister Jonathan Bell. Another DUP minister, Simon Hamilton, said he only learned at the inquiry that he didn't follow the rules he was supposed to. I suppose with the benefit of, of reflection and the evidence that the committee or the inquiry has, has heard, it is clear to me that the guidance that I was given in respect of the process did not comply fully. Um, well, is, I, 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 it, it seems to me that uh, you simply did not uh, comply with the code. Sinn Féin Minister Martin O'Muller, the minister who set up the inquiry, testified that he had followed the code. Did you have some regard to this code? For example, did you consider a pool of candidates, more than one candidate? Yes, I did. I, uh, I fairly rapidly uh, identified two people who I thought would be uh, able to do the job. But you're confident you did, in fact, consider a uh, oh, pool absolutely. of candidates? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember the, especially speaking to one lady uh, right. directly, yeah. And if needs be, albeit not, not in the chamber today, if needs be, you can provide the names of those, those other people? Martino Muller said he, he did have a pool that seemed to um, uh, amount to thinking of someone yes, or pool, maybe speaking yes. to someone. Is that, is that sufficient? No, no, it really wouldn't be. One would expect if you're going to have a pool, you would be able to evidence the pool. I mean, one could argue that at least he'd thought about somebody else and he'd actually apparently had some sort of say, perhaps, even in who his special advisors were, whereas obviously Jonathan Bell and perhaps the others had no say at all. So, you know, but I mean, nobody can call that a pool. You know, there's supposed to be records of it. And it's just ridiculous. The inquiry concluded the DUP and Sinn Féin effectively frustrated the purpose of democratically enacted legislation around the appointment of SPADs. But those parties knew how to fix the problem. The RHI inquiry made clear that some ministers either couldn't or wouldn't follow the rules set out in this code. So when the parties returned to Stormont earlier this year, they got rid of the code. Instead of following the rules, they simply got rid of the rules. A new code replaced the old one and removed all the specific requirements about how ministers should appoint their spads. The previous code runs to 33 pages because there's a lot of stuff in it. The latest code is two. In fact, it's so short that when I first got it, I thought this was just the covering letter and there must be a code somewhere else. So I went and looked it up to find it. No, it, it runs to two pages and it just says, once the SPAD's appointed, a civil service should be told about it. That's it. So they've responded to um, uh, criticism of not um, fulfilling the old code by bringing in a new code. Oh yes, it, it removes all, the, all pretense at assessment, selection, criteria merit, everything, it just says minister's going to appoint a SPAD. And yet that was supposed to be a code that incorporated yeah. some of the criticism that had emerged from the RHI inquiry. Uh -huh. But and you're just didn't. seeing the clout of the two big parties saying, well, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. The inquiry's scrutiny of Martino Muller also raises questions about a key commitment he'd made when he set it up in the first place. Openness and transparency will be key touchstones. There cannot be obstacles placed uh, in the way of truth. But what happened next shed a new light 
on Marcino Muller's commitment to openness and transparency. The woman he said he'd spoken to about becoming a special advisor told the inquiry that conversation never happened. I have never had a conversation with Mr Muller in which he explored my interest in becoming a SPAD. What's more, she told the inquiry that the former minister had contacted her on the very day the inquiry told him to name names in his so-called pool of candidates. He then asked me if we had ever previously had a conversation about me potentially becoming his SPAD. I said that we had not, and he asked if we had ever had such a conversation, even in jest. Mr O'Muller has insisted that he's given a truthful account of what happened. But in the midst of an embarrassing dispute over what he did or didn't say, the key point is that he told the woman he would support her desire to keep her identity secret. Mr O'Muller told her, I can assure you that I have requested that the RHI inquiry respects your anonymity. Is there a contradiction there between what, what, what he said would happen and what he did? Well, I think there is. I mean, no stone unturned. When people saw the inquiry, they probably felt that that was probably true because of the rigorous nature of the questioning and the number of witnesses, etc., etc. This woman had a completely different uh, take on what had transpired. She made it very clear she didn't want to have anything to do with this inquiry because of the reputational damage which just been linked to it at all, given that she was in business. I suppose you could argue that he was trying to follow that, um, that view, but it wasn't enough. If you're going to be transparent, you have to be absolutely transparent. We asked Martino Muller if he saw any contradiction between his commitment to openness and transparency and his request to keep the identity of a witness contradicting his testimony from becoming public. He hasn't responded, but on Friday, he tweeted that he was proud to have commissioned the RHI inquiry. Marcino Muller, like several ministers and spads embroiled in RHI, has left politics. But one minister has come out the other side of the fire of RHI, Arlene Foster. Just around this corner is the First Minister's office at Stormont. And when Arlene Foster first walked down here to take up her new job as First Minister, she very much emphasised her competence and her expertise. Mr Speaker, you will be aware that this is not the first time that I have taken the pledge of office. That experience has prepared me for the challenges that will undoubtedly lie ahead. This is not a time for the untried or the untested. This is a time for experience and stability. Whilst I'm one of the youngest party leaders, I have an unrivaled track record of delivery. But the inquiry's findings suggest that in practice, she was a minister who was very far from across the detail. The inquiry indicated Arlene Foster had been poorly served by civil servants, but said she should have asked more questions when RHI was set up. They said she should not have signed a document justifying the spend on RHI without getting all the necessary information about the costs. And when she did not read the RHI regulations, they said she failed to do a core part of a minister's job, even though that might have had no effect on the outcome of RHI. Can't she rebuild her reputation, do you think? People will always remember this, and you can see, you know, if people still voted for her. And in some ways, there's really no alternative in the DUP, so I think she's, she's fairly safe. Well, this report showed that she brought legislation before the Assembly that she hadn't read. But when she came and gave an interview subsequently to Irish News, when she said she couldn't expect to be across every jot and tittle, this was somebody who had earlier said she had a lawyer's eye for detail. And I think she has been damaged by it. Not enough to threaten her position. But I think she's not the person that we thought she was. Be under no illusions. She has been damaged by this. This is not good for her. And whenever the political obituary is written on her, this will be front and centre. Businesswoman Jeanette O'Hagan was an admirer of Arlene Foster back in 2013. I was really impressed by Arlene Foster, especially because she was a woman, you know, um, and I, I suppose, looked up to her in that respect because she had a lot of responsibility. She had a really important job and 
it looked like she was doing it well. Jeanette O'Hagan is one of the few people to come out of the RHI inquiry with any credit. She saw faults in the RHI scheme that civil servants and the minister missed and emailed Arlene Foster personally about it. I would never have questioned government at that time. I just thought they're the people that know. But obviously something slipped here. They've missed this. At the time I thought, well, great, I'm, I'll go to the top and I'll get her attention and then this will all be OK. Civil servants did meet her, but then ignored her stark warning. I was really quite positive about it. I thought I've been given the opportunity to voice my concerns here. They act, they're going to listen. And what happened? They didn't listen. It was going through the motions and um, they just weren't engaged with, with what I had to say. I think they were meeting me because they had to and they didn't accept for whatever reason what I had to say was legitimate and valid. I remember closing the door of the meeting and thinking, what a waste of my time. When the political firestorm broke, the DUP falsely claimed she hadn't warned Arlene Foster. We've now managed to get our hands on the original email correspondence that was sent in to Arlene by the so-called whistleblower, and in fact it shows... Why so-called whistleblower? Well, because a whistleblower has to raise a particular issue of concern in relation to the RHI issue. And the central allegation was, oh, this was raised with Arlene, she passed it on, and nothing further was done. In fact, in the email correspondence, the issue was not raised with Arlene. But she had raised it with Arlene Foster. The inquiry said Mrs O'Hagan had every right to feel aggrieved when the DUP assertions led to her identity becoming public against her wishes. It was awful. Bear in mind that I brought this to their attention as a concerned citizen, but never for one minute did I think that that concern would ever play a role in the public. So to be caught up in that was tough. Well, that's not my world. Um, and it was, it was distressing. How were you feeling? Distressed and disappointed, I suppose. I just thought, again, you probably think they wouldn't do that. You know, they, you know they've got a position, respect, respected position, and their job is for the citizens. So I was really disappointed that, you know, it was OK to release that and point the media storm towards me and getting somebody else off the hook. Going back to um, the beginning, you know, your first interaction was with Arlene Foster. How much has your opinion of Mrs Foster changed since then? Hmm. I mean, there's a lot of mistakes have been made, a lot of, uh, you know, on her watch. She is concerned that if she had a similar issue to flag to government, she still wouldn't be sure where to turn. It definitely has tarnished my opinion of how that side of things works, and I think there's a, an awful lot of work to do for people like me with foul concerns. And there was an attitude that outsiders were something to be kept away and their motives were to be suspect. I mean, absolutely, you know, complaints and so on. No, these, these people must be doing this for a reason. There is a sort of assumption that anybody, you know, a concerned citizen has a motive, has an axe to grind, and we would need to keep people away. And that's a mammoth issue to, to address. I mean, that's only by permanent secretaries and the like saying, no, this is not how we're going to work. You must, you know, welcome the people who pay your salaries. What makes her treatment all the more appalling is the fact that she didn't go knives out no, no. straight to the papers. She actually went in and said, look, guys, I'm trying to help you here. I've discovered that this really, really perverse incentive is going to cost you millions and you need to pay attention to it. So she had done the decent thing. She was actually trying to be helpful to the system and that's why her treatment was so bad. The DUP and the civil service have publicly apologised to Jeanette O'Hagan. Like her, many RHI participants also find themselves with diminished trust in government. Five years ago, these things were very much the future. But of course now, there are quite a few people who wish they'd never heard of a biomass boiler and certainly wish they'd never heard of RHI. Tyrone poultry farmer Gary Liggett is one of them. So this is the, uh, one of the infamous RHI boilers. Gary? It is indeed. This uh, particular boiler on this site 
was fitted in July 2015. And how many do you have all together? Five boilers, over five poultry sheds. And when you see this boiler now, what goes through your mind? The greatest mistake that I have ever made personally, and <laughs> hate the sight of them, Connor, to be quite honest. Not bad. Oh, I wish I'd never seen RHA. Yes, totally. Gary Leggett borrowed heavily to install boilers and expand his poultry business, believing RHI would help cover his repayments. But since the RHI controversy erupted, boiler owners like him have seen the amounts paid to them cut by as much as 90%. The audit office believes the cut will ward off the huge threatened Stormont overspend. But Gary Leggett worries he may struggle to compete with farmers on higher biomass subsidies in Great Britain and the Republic. From a personal point of view, I signed into a scheme, invested large sums of money, continue to make large repayments every month, and I can't walk away from the commitment I have made there. I had no reason to ever doubt the fact that a government scheme wouldn't be probably one of the best things that you could invest in because it would be, well, if you, if you can't trust the government, who, who, who can you trust? You know that, that the state, uh, that the Northern Ireland government um, can't afford to pay at the rate that they were paying you before, that it's going to, that it's going to cause a massive overspend. We are entitled to what we signed into and what we were promised. I can't change my commitments to the bank just by saying that I can't afford to pay it. I have to pay it. He says his belief in the security of RHI payments was bolstered by a letter Arlene Foster wrote to banks, promoting government support for RHI as reliable, long-term, and offering a good return on investment. I think everyone that was uh, trying to secure finance at that time, Connor, knew that that was, that was in circulation and that was that was the reason that the banks were, were on side with it. It gave the banks the assurance that uh, the investments being made on farms like mine and everyone else's had a capability of being paid back. Um, as it did to us as well, we signed into it in good faith that we were going to be availing of these payments. Other than that, we would certainly would never have invested in the scheme at all. And so how important was Mrs Foster's letter? Oh, it was very important because basically, as you can see, the banks were lending a lot of money on something which basically has no value outside the scheme. What do you think of that letter now? Oh, this is a good fire letter, isn't it? Basically. That's all it's worth to you? That's all it's worth. Gary Leggett is far from unique in his understanding of what Mrs Foster's letter meant. Last month, I spoke to other disgruntled boiler owners, gathered for the AGM of their lobby group, the Renewable Heat Association. Well, it was so disastrously put together. You can't trust them anymore. They gave me a 20-year promise and they've broken it. Very difficult for an individual to go out and spend £30,000 based upon guarantees from the government and then the government to withdraw them. The thing is, in the future, you wouldn't trust them as... Honestly, how could you? The government argue that the letter has been misinterpreted. In a statement, Arlene Foster said it was a matter of regret that payments participants initially received from the RHI scheme were much higher than what was actually pledged in her letter. The reduction in RHI payments meant Gary Leggett had to take drastic action to meet his loan commitments. He had to change the way he farms completely. You would have had quite a big operation here then at one point. We were milking 150 cows, Connor, and then there was about 100 followers. This deserted shed used to house a dairy farm his father had built up over decades. The decision that was taken last year to change our business path had a, had a very big impact on our family. It, it was, it was probably the dairy farm was here a long time before the poultry farm. The poultry farm was there and then RHI came along. RHI came along and it has basically wiped out the dairy farm side of the business because cash was scarce and the business had to 
keep going and money had to be had to be raised. Do you feel guilty about that at times? Yes. Yes. I do. I feel responsible for investing in RHA even though I wasn't to know what was coming down the road. Ultimately I feel personally responsible for what has happened within my own farm. And what sort of emotional impact did that have on you and your family having to take that step of selling off the dairy herd that you've built up over so many years? Like that must be a very difficult conversation for you to have. The most difficult I have ever had. He admits he's struggling both to make his debt repayments and with the impact on his mental health. Anxiety and depression do start to get in on you. RHA is also something that is very hard to talk about because very few people understand the problems that it has created and there's still a stigma out there where people think that, that you are profiteering out of something and that you are, you're, you're still being criminalised and victimised over the, over the head of the whole thing. Um, but yes, massive, massive effect on my own mental health, yes. You've actually suffered depression as a consequence of all of this? Yes, definitely. It's ripped the soul out of me. As time passes on after the publication of the RHI inquiry report, there will of course be much less discussion about boilers, wood pellets, kilowatt hours, tariffs, and about who knew what when. And that offers an opportunity for politicians to draw a line under the scandal of RHI with meaningful reform. But when their response to being caught breaking the rules is simply to say, well, let's just get rid of the rules then. Maybe the average citizen is entitled to some scepticism about whether things will really change. Now, as the coronavirus crisis unfolds, we'll see quickly whether the new executive can unify in the fight against it. Last Thursday evening, the parties agreed to keep schools open, despite the decision to close them in the Republic. We are working together. We're being guided by the medical science. We don't believe at this moment in time that that is the right step to take. The next morning, Michelle O'Neill performed a complete U-turn. Now is the time to take action. Now is the time to ensure that all schools are closed, that universities and colleges are closed, and that needs to happen immediately. The Deputy First Minister says the executive remains largely unified, but it has been seen as a bad sign for the future. One of the things that Sir Patrick talked about was this notion that there should be a more collective sense that the ministers work with each other. And initially, Michelle O'Neill standing beside it? Arlene Foster about the coronavirus. And then less than 24 hours later, Michelle O'Neill's there saying, actually, we should be following school closures in the Republic. You would know yourself, Stephen, there's a lot of the optics. And the optics have to be something that the public can buy into. And that needs to be unity. The basis of all good emergency planning is a single message mm -hmm. and no surprises. The problem will be, do the public trust them? And the public trust has taken a big hit. And this is a time that they have to try to build that again. And one of the ways they can build that again is by appearing collectively and not just the DUP Sinn Féin. Bizarrely, the coronavirus emergency is an opportunity for the executive to get involved in some serious cross-departmental cooperation, because this is going to involve all arms of government. I wouldn't bet uh, my life on it, although in many ways I am <laughs> at my age. But we are getting to the stage where this will probably be a bit of a final test. Can this ever work? Tonight, Stormont faces a challenge much graver than RHI. Political unity is already fraying at the very time citizens are trusting Stormont not to fail as it did so badly before.